Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, okay, so, so uh, me, Emma, and uh, Judy were charged with each delivering a vision for how the field of genomics uh, um, would look over the next five to 10 years. I'm gonna focus on the 10-year the time point. Um, this is a lot to bite off in 15 minutes, um, but I've given it my best shot, and um, I've broadly uh, divided things into four um, areas. So um, within each of these areas, I'm gonna um, just highlight kind of some of the, the current uh, challenges and then um, uh, propose a few goals that are maybe in that gray zone of, uh, on one hand, being risky and challenging, um, but on the other hand, um, you know, at least for my, my, my vantage point being uh, uh, potentially achievable. Okay, so, um, uh, and also I think, you know, just to, to touch back to Eric's comment, I think these are things that would be at the forefront and, and more broadly um, catalytic uh, for the field, possibly. So, um, Okay, so first category here, uh, mapping the genetic basis of human phenotypes. So I've broken this into a few different areas. Um, so one, just uh, genomes and genetic variation, right? So uh, right now we, have, we, of course, have large catalogs of, of genetic variation. Um, two of the um, uh, key challenges are, uh, one, um, inadequate representation of, of the world's population. I think I'm only gonna glancingly touch on this, but I think it's a very important topic that I think will hopefully recur um, over the next couple days. Um, and, then, and then inadequate representation of certain classes of variants, structural variants in particular. Um, and so for those first challenges, I think you can imagine now with the, the, the way that technologies have evolved and the cost structures have evolved that um, getting to something like the equivalent of a thousand genomes project, but for a much larger number, and moreover with, with long reads and, and haplotype resolution and de novo assembly would go a long ways towards kind of getting us toward, towards more comprehensive views of, of human variation across the world. And then at least for some small number of genomes, maybe dozens, it would be terrific to have telomere to telomere uh, complete no N uh, sequences. Um, okay, and then it's kind of crazy that you can throw out numbers like this and they don't seem so crazy anymore, but, but um, you know, we're, we're, it's not unrealistic to imagine that in 10 years, um, you know, we will have collectively sequenced um, on the order of 0.1% of the world's population. Maybe it'll actually come much quicker than that. Um, so I think that, that piece does not feel that, that hard. I think the harder piece uh, is one, I think, getting it to be um, diverse and representative, and then moreover to have it be, you know, integrated and unified with phenotypes and electronic medical records in a way that, that uh, actually makes it, it useful for, for, quote, population scale genetics. Okay. so. Um, Genetics of common disease, right? So uh, GWAS studies have been, um, on one hand, um, from, a, from a certain vantage point, an incredible success. We've got um, tens of thousands of common haplotypes that are associated with common traits and diseases. On the other hand, there's only a handful of these for which the causal uh, variants and genes are, are uh, confidently uh, known. Um, I, I would hope that by 2029, we're able to make significant progress on this. Um, so you could imagine um, perhaps an achievable goal is to, is to aim for something like 1,000. So for the strongest 1,000 associations, could we actually uh, pinpoint with confidence um, the causal variants and genes and understand a bit about the, the mechanism? Um, the, uh, oh, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong place, so I'm a little bit behind here. Um, the other place where I think, at least I'm quite excited, is, is around uh, polygenic risk scores and their potential for use in the clinic. Um, I think this is a fast evolving space, of course, so we don't know what the future uh, holds here, but I think it seems like an area that's at least worth um, a significant um, further uh, investment and exploration um, uh, for really opening up the use of genomics to, a, um, to, under, to, to, to uh, adjudicate risk uh, on a population scale for many common diseases even without necessarily understanding the underlying mechanism. And of course, there are big risks here. This, for example, this little graphic I took is, is from a, a life insurance website where they're also very excited about polygenic risk scores. Um, okay, genetics of rare disease, this is an easy one. The last 10 years, we've seen a, a renaissance of Mendelian uh, disease gene discovery. Uh, there remains, you know, the last 20% takes 80% of the work, a uh, stubborn fraction of both disorders as well as cases um, uh, in the clinical setting remain intractable. Um, you know, you can imagine by 2029, an achievable goal would be uh, understanding the genetic basis, the vast majority, let's say greater than 95% of Mendelian disorders. I think this means shifting from turning the crank on the usual modalities like exome sequencing and really going after some of the alternative explanations for, um, for, for uh, what could be uh, underlying Mendelian disorders, so somatic mutations, repeat expansions, things that aren't necessarily picked up 
by conventional methods and are, are part of why um, we currently aren't there. Um, okay, and then in a clinical setting, um, you know, of course, this has been one of the, the successes of the last 10 years is the use of exome sequencing um, for uh, diagnosis, um, but right now this is still a, um, I still think a minority of cases where this works. And you can imagine if we could, if we could change this and, and uh, eliminate the diagnostic odysseys for the uh, clear majority of these patients, that would be an important impact. Okay, uh, mapping the uh, consequences of um, uh, human genetic variation, right? So um, here in 2019, we've got to, I think, uh, have made amazing progress towards a framework for, for data sharing that broadly includes academia and, and most companies uh, as well. Um, variants of uncertain significance still persist as a challenge and aren't, aren't going anywhere. Um, by 2029, you could imagine um, uh, using methods like uh, genome editing um, and other uh, methods like mutational scanning to basically create a catalog of uh, functionally um, or meaningful, clinically meaningful functional scores for uh, every possible SNV in, quote, clinically actionable genes, right? And, and this would essentially um, circumvent the VUS problem by pre-computing a interpretation for, for any, for the, the most likely changes that you would see in a, in a, in a new patient. Um, thinking more broadly about variation in the, in the, in the genome uh, as a whole, right? So one of the exciting developments over the last few years has been the development of a range of technologies um, for functionalizing variants at scale. So whether based on CRISPR, massively parallel reporter assays, um, and, and um, uh, another, another concurrent trend has been um, the proliferation of algorithms uh, for variant effect prediction. So an arbitrary variant, you can make some prediction about what it will do. Uh, the limitations here, the challenges are the technologies are still relatively new and it's not super clear um, how to scale them. Uh, and to be frank, the algorithms really don't work that well, right? Particularly if you're thinking about putting them in a, in a clinical setting. Um, so, I, you know, you could, you, could, you could argue, or I would argue, that um, in, in many ways the the, the second challenge is, is data limited, right? We simply don't have enough training examples to, to build effective models. Um, and so it's not out of the realm of possibility that, that by scaling um, some of these multiplex methods that we could generate functional data of some sort uh, in some context, it's never gonna be perfect, um, for on the order of uh, at least 0.1% of all possible variants in the genome, right? Uh, which would be about nine million uh, SNVs. And you can imagine then this becomes the fodder for the development of um, algorithms that can accurately predict um, the effects of arbitrary variants. And I say in there the proximal molecular effects because I think it's important to walk before you can run, right? We're not gonna be able to predict the effects on organismal phenotype if we can't predict what's happening at the locus or in the gene or in the protein, right? So you've gotta get those early steps first before you can actually build out to a broader understanding. Um, okay. Next category here, uh, uh, global views of, uh, global molecular views of, of cellular and organismal phenotypes. All right, so here in um, 2019, we have these um, amazing and, and really widely used uh, catalogs of uh, a broad range of, of biochemical annotations that have been generated by the ENCODE project roadmap and, and, and so on, and, and I think that the the rate of uptake and, and citation and use of these, I think, is a testament to their value. Um, some of the, the uh, challenges here include that these are primarily um, done on uh, cell lines and in tissues, um, and um, uh, rather than, than in vivo at, at high resolution um, uh, on, on, um, on everything you can imagine. So as everyone here, I think, is, is is aware of the, this field, this area has seen a proliferation of new technologies for, for high resolution uh, molecular profiling, in particular at the single cell level. And so you can imagine by, by 2029, uh, essentially going after many or all of these same biochemical marks, so gene expression, histone mods, TF binding, et cetera, um, but, but at a cellular level, so, so every cell um, across all of developmental time um, including spatial coordinates and kind of a continuous view of development and how the genome unfolds with respect to regulation as all those processes um, take place. And I think it's critical that, you know, obviously there's a lot of emphasis on, on humans for good reasons, but really the, I think a lot of the money is, is with the model organisms here. 
uh, if we, you know, for building that comprehensive understanding in a, in a way, and I'll come back to this later, in a way that you can then perturb and see what happens. And that's really how you build, uh, build a um, deeper understanding. Okay, so um, last topic here, functional understanding, a functional predictive um, understanding of the genome. So um, just coming back really to the same point of uh, ENCODE and where we are right now. All right, so we have these, these catalogs. Um, you could argue that they're primarily descriptive catalogs uh, and they're, they're highly in internally correlated, so to speak. So we've, we have a lot of annotations and many of those annotations are correlated with other annotations within the same data set and it's really hard to, to pull out um, an understanding of, of function or mechanism here. Um, so so how, do we, how do we go from this, 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 uh, these comprehensive descriptive catalogs into a, into a more functional and mechanistic understanding? And so, um, uh, by 2029. So, this is just one flavor of, uh, of what could, I think, be many different ways of approaching this, but um, I think this is the kind of thing that, that one could imagine to try and move the ball forward here. So, um, using um, uh, newer methods like CRISPR uh, to basically take advantage of these catalogs and systematically perturb uh, the genome in some reasonable range of contexts to try and see what happens to the regulatory landscape. Right? And that, that process of systematic perturbation and, and measurement is kind of, I think, how we, how we advance from description to, to a functional understanding. And then kind of just hearkening back to, to one of the earlier themes, building these kinds of large data sets around functional perturbations are in turn the fodder for um, predictive modeling, right? So, you know, just looking back in time, you think about GenScan and the, the revolutionary impact that had on the Human Genome Project with the ability to take an arbitrary sequence that the algorithm had never seen before and to build quite accurate models of, of gene structure, um, you know, based on what were at the time, I think, a few thousand examples of what a gene looked like, right? So regulation is harder or we'd already be there, um, uh, but it's the kind of thing that I, I think is a, is a problem that is attackable with machine learning with, with a significantly... Um, larger uh, uh, data sets uh, that are not just descriptive but also uh, perturbative. Um, and, and you can imagine a future where just like GenScan could predict gene structure across arbitrary sequences that it had never seen before, you could feed an algorithm sequence that it had never, never seen before and it would essentially accurately, based on sequence alone, um, uh, come up with uh, some description of these, these very same properties that we've measured with ENCODE, right? Okay. So um, I think this may be the last topic here. So understanding gene function. So it's a it's a real it's a real shame uh, that you know we're we're now uh, you know what 15 odd years past the the end of the, the human genome project and we still don't know what all the genes do right. There's there's roughly 20,000 genes. We pretty much know where they all are. Maybe there's some link RNA still hanging out there that we haven't gotten. But uh, there's no you know there hasn't really been a systematic effort to try and nailed down gene function. I think this is one of the things that's holding the entire field back um, uh, is that we, 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 just, we just don't know, right? So, um, so how to approach this? I think, they're, they're, you know, I think the, the, the response to this is always like, well, how are you gonna do it, right? And I think there's no, there's no easy answer to this, which is part of why no one's done it. Um, I think we can, we can try to advance the ball though. So just one, one thought here about one way to, of approaching this by 2029 would be, and this is again, kind of a pitch for, for single cell atlases in model organisms, if you really have a comprehensive description of the molecular phenotype of an organism at single cell resolution, you know, my guess is that by, by going back and systematically knocking out each of the 20,000 genes and making those same measurements, you're gonna see functional effects, right? You're gonna observe what they do, at least to some degree, and, and start to build up a, a, you know, some progress towards more understanding of, of function. But then more generally, I think, you know, I'm not sure this is the right analogy for it, but we need some framework, I think, for really thinking about, you know, are we going to do this? And, and if so, um, how are we going to get there? Are we just going to let it continue to trickle along? Um, okay, so I'll just, if I've got a minute left, I think I've got, I think I've got a minute left. Um, I'll just close with a couple, uh, 30 seconds left. A um, couple of kind of broader, broader thoughts. So, so I'm not going to talk about the how we'll get there to any of these goals in, in any specifics, but just kind of in broad strokes, things that I think are worth, I'd like to emphasize. So, uh, uh, you know, moving from, from genome-wide description to, to genome-wide perturbation, right? We can now, you know, in many ways, description was 
Genome-wide description was enabled by multiplex sequencing, a multiplex readout technology, and now we have the ability to perturb in, in multiplex, and so as just as that scaled from tens of thousands to billions of reads, you can imagine scaling from tens of thousands to billions of perturbations over time. Um, weaning off of standing variation as, you know, kind of our main perturbogen, right, so to speak, right? This is kind of classical genetics, but I think we can with, with uh, CRISPR and other tools, um, you know, large-scale oligo DNA synthesis, we can increasingly move towards, you know, making large numbers of variants or per perturbations or whatever it is, uh, rather than relying solely on standing variation. Um, building massive data sets, millions, on the order of millions to billions of functional measurements that in turn uh, facilitate the development of predictive models that are not black boxes, but rather ones that you can hopefully glean some generalizations from. Um, doubling down on model organisms. I think there were any, any retreat from model organisms, at least in my view, is a, is a bad idea. I think until we completely understand how you go from a single cell zygote to a worm or a fish or a, or a mouse, um, I think we're selling ourselves short um, on human biology. Um, and then, uh, I saw some people go like that, but okay. And then, um, you know, I think advancing from, from catalogs, which I think are important and, and something that we should actually continue to do, but, but, but trying to um, complement that with a greater emphasis on a functional understanding of variants, genes, loci, cell types, organisms, and, and phenotypes. Okay, even broader strokes. Um, I think things that the NIGRI has done well and, and should continue to do, so a continued emphasis on the basic science of the genome, um, a continued emphasis on, uh, and these are things I think that really make this institute unique, um, on, on technology and, and computation as drivers, um, uh, building clinical value for genomic data, right? So I think implementation is important, but if you build the value, that's kind of the most important thing, obviously. Um, Early sharing of, of data methods and results, which I think is something that has become pervasive, I think largely consequent to this community. And then I think um, something that I think the Institute has done well and, and I think will hopefully continue to do well is a healthy balance of uh, top-down and, and bottom-up uh, science. And I will stop there and um, pass it over to Emma or Judy, whoever's next. Judy, okay.